Здравейте, Юра. Колеги, здравейте и от мен. Много се радвам, че днес имаме възможност да чуем лекцията на един забележителен учен и приятел на България и на Института за балканистика с Център по тракология, доцент Спиридон Пломидис от Атинския университет. Започваме с малко закъснение, за това без повече предисловие ще дам думата на нашия лектор, а след неговата презентация ще имате възможност да задавате въпроси и да споделите своите коментари и впечатления. Доцент Пломиди, заповядайте. Значи, за... а... започваме ли? Започваме. А, така. Е, уважаеми колеги, добър вечер. Е, днес ще говоря по-английски и после мога да приемам а... въпроси и на български, ако желаете. Значи, е... Today, this evening, I will uh, present you a few uncertain images of the monarchy in Greece in the 19th and the 20th century, the modern period. Uh, the representation of uh, monarchy, as uh, I have uh, already mentioned in the title of my presentation, the representation of monarchy as an antidote to anarchy was a strong form of legitimization of the monarchical institution, both in pre-modern and in modern times. Therefore, firstly and mostly, I need to clarify that uh, uh, this image was nothing new in modern times. Actually, it dates back to the Roman times and more particularly to the first century AD, uh, when uh, Octavian, Octavian Augustus, the first Roman emperor, bestowed upon himself the extraordinary powers of princeps and imperator in order to face the internal crisis of government that tore apart Republican Rome at the time. The image of monarchy as a Panakia for anarchy and civil strife was therefore grounded in the Roman legal tradition and political thought. Um, in other words, this image of monarchy was deeply rooted in historical experience and Roman political history. In modern Greece, this formula dates back to 1821, meaning the Greek Revolution. And um, that's because the Greek Revolution and its Republican constitutions were identified by European statesmen with anarchy and demagogy. And they were therefore, for this reason, condemned by the Allied Great Powers at the Verona Conference of the Secret Alliance of the Sacred Alliance in 1822, in October 1822 because in their minds at the time, um, the Greek Revolution was seen as a danger to peace and social order in Europe. On the other hand, a foreign monarch was deemed as a guardian of order and tranquility in the Near East, in the Near East and also in the best interests of Europe at the time. Arguably, monarchy in Greece was in the best interest of Europe at that time, because Europe, as we all know, was, had been uh, shortly before shaken by the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. For this main reason, uh, the great powers, the three great powers that, li that uh, liberated Greece, meaning England, France, and Russia, chose in 1930 a uh, German prince namely Leopold, the Duke of Saxe-Coburg, and two years later, in 1932, Otto, Prince of Bavaria, as Kings of Greece. However, um, the, um, 
imposition of monarchy in Greece uh, can be explained by both external and internal reasons. It was a, a necessity, an absolute necessity, an exigency at the time. Um, and the three powers, England, France, and uh, Germany, proved to be correct in, in, the, in this decision. Uh, in 1832, when uh, Prince Otto Bavaria arrived in Greece, in 1933 actually, in 1932, uh, 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 an uh, international agreement was signed in London, stipulating uh, the offer of the Greek crown to, king, to the, for the future king. And uh, a few months later, in January 1833, uh, the new king of Greece arrived in Athmium. In eight, by 1833, absolute uh, monarchy was deemed as imperative for both the welfare and the good government of the new state. And the reason that lay behind this was civil war. Greeks were deemed back then and uh, later on as uh, having a rowdy character, a quarrelsome character, and only kingship, uh, that meaning monarchy, and uh, more particularly absolute monarchy, was in a position to put an end to their petty ambitions and quarrels. Um, and uh, I'm quoting here a famous American Greek historian, John Anthony Petropoulos, who in 1968, in his uh, PhD thesis, he explains that the foreign monarch alien to Greece's internal factions was naturally seen at the time as the best remedy for Greece's internes in strife. And a, uh, the, uh, a monarch, an absolute monarch, uh, was the only, uh, will be the only figure who will guarantee internal unity and stability in the newly born country and uh, save eventually Greece from self-destruction. Uh, behind all this, uh, in the backdrop, the backdrop of all these events, of these uh, developments, internal developments in Greece, lay the fact that Greeks eventually, uh, shortly after their liberation, proved themselves unable uh, and incapable for self-rule, for self-government. Um, and. Uh, the irony is as that a decisive role in the final choice of this form of government, meaning monarchy, had been played actually by Capodistrias, Greece's first, first governor. John Capodistrias, according to the testimony of the first Austrian envoy to Greece, had uh, stressed that the federal unconstitutional polity, aching to that of the United States of America, the only republic existing at the time, uh, and a polity in Greece uh, um, aching to that of the United States of America that uh, actually had initially inspired many Greek revolutionaries will merely bring anarchy. That's what um, uh, surfaced in Capodistrias's mind. By contrast, in, uh, according to Capodistrias, monarchy will be the sole polity that could withstand revolution and integrate Greece into the contemporary security system of Vienna, which had been established by the victors of Napoleon in 1815. Um, the irony is that uh, uh, this uh, exigency, this necessity uh, to uh, elect a, a monarch and a foreign monarch to save Greece from self-destruction, uh, followed the assassination of Count Capodistrias in 1931. Right after his uh, assassination, Greece uh, found itself again in chaos and in a state of uh, a very bloody civil war. Therefore, uh, King Otto, when he eventually arrived in Greece in early 1833, uh, was welcomed as a messiah who will save Greece from chaos and anarchy. 30 years later, 30 years later, when uh, King Otto was eventually 
dethroned and a new king uh, from Denmark was uh, chosen to resume the Greek crown. Um, the same pattern followed. Uh, in 1862 and in 1863, uh, Greece became the battlefield of international war, chaos, and anarchy. A well-known square in the center of Athens, Plateo Monians, meaning uh, uh, Place de la Concorde, uh, as I will say, uh, is a, remind, is a reminder of all uh, these developments back in 1862. Um, this square, Plateo Monias, bore previously the name of the former king, King Otto, and it was uh, renamed as Place de la Concorde as a token of harmony and unity between Greeks that found themselves again in a state of civil strife. Um, the dethronement of Otto, all in all, caused a serious breakdown of public order, with gangs of bandits reaching even the outskirts of Athens. Political instability and, cha and chaos prevailed for a year, for about a year, uh, once more, and therefore uh, the election of a new foreign king became an absolute necessity. According to the biographer of the new king, Prince George of Denmark, by October 1863, when uh, um, this young prince, prince, uh, prince George of Denmark, lay foot in Piraeus for the first time, the country had undergone a painful phase of absolute anarchy owing to the most awful political discords, which had uh, torn the country apart for about a year, as I have already mentioned. Consequently, King George, who at the time was a minor of 70 years of age, came to Greece as a messiah, exactly as King Otto uh, was seen as a savior and messiah 30 years earlier. And his uh, first and prime task was to restore order, stability, and tranquility in the country. All in all, monarchy reflected, as I already have mentioned, the incapacity of Greeks to rule themselves um, and to uh, establish uh, a solid form of self-government. In this, Greece was by far an exceptional case. Around the same time, uh, three years later, in 1966, in Romania, the enthronement of a foreign ruler, namely King Carol I of the Hohenzollern dynasty, the, actually the Catholic branch of the Hohenzollern Sigmaringen dynasty, uh, was placed in the Romanian throne in the place of an indigenous prince, Prince Ion Cusa, uh, because a foreign monarch was regarded as a prerequisite of uh, for the restoration of political stability and tranquility in this Balkan country. Along the same lines in Bulgaria, the election of Ferdinand of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha by the Sovranie in 1987, in a more democratic way though, was aimed expressly and according to the remarks of uh, the historian Richard Crampton, was aimed expressly at ending an interregnum of anarchy, meaning lawlessness and political instability that followed the dethronement of his predecessor, uh, Prince Alexander I of Badenberg. This formula, monarchy versus anarchy, gained momentum in Greece again during the First World War. In 1915 to 1917, uh, Greece experienced an unprecedented political crisis, in fact, a low-key civil war that divided Greece into two opposing separate states centered upon Athens and Salonika. This crisis later came to be known as the National Schism. This crisis was sparked by a strong disagreement between the liberal premier of Greece, Eleftherios Venizelos, and King Constantine, over foreign and uh, military policies 
as well uh, over constitutional issues. From the onset of this national schism, the royalists in Greece stigmatized Venizelos as a maniacal enemy of the king and a herald of anarchy, national disintegration, and international war. Um, by this time, though, um, anarchy had taken uh, the form of Venizelism, as you can easily understand. The meaning had uh, anarchy took on the meaning of Venizelism, meaning, uh, if you uh, think more profoundly, radical liberalism and republicanism. Anarchy took over another meaning. It wasn't just the, the doesn't, it didn't mean uh, only civil war, but it took on uh, uh, through history, uh, several other uh, meanings. Three years later in 1920, uh, when Greece was entangled in another war, not against Germany and Bulgaria, but against Turkey this time once more, by 1920, anarchy took also uh, another form, an extra form, uh, the form of communism. And the king, King Constantine, once more was seen and represented as a bulwark against the threat of a communist overthrow. Um, and um, this, uh, this uh, new vision of um, monarchy as a deterrent of uh, communism uh, repeated himself and proved once again and twice again and, and again to be useful for the champions of monarchy in Greece. In 1934, in 1946 and later on in the post-war period in the, at the times of the Cold War. Uh, and the uh, kings of Greece were seen as the symbol of national unity and um, as uh, the focus of the new order that the Western powers uh, were striving to establish in post-war Europe against uh, Soviet Russia. Uh, over time, this discourse of monarchy versus anarchy became organically interwoven with institution of monarchy. And it is of no surprise that in 1974, when the last referendum uh, over the, on the form of government took place in Greece, uh, King uh, Constantine II, the last king of Greece, was in his two televised messages to the Greek people, stressed that monarchy was a symbol of national unity. More generally, in this occasion, the champions of monarchy argued uh, once more again that the king, by standing aloof for politi from political parties, symbolizes national uni unity and that monarchy secures tranquility, whereas the Republic uh, can possibly degenerate into anarchy. Uh, even at the very last moment in 1974, anarchy was uh, still a strong ideological weapon, let's say weapon, in the uh, hands of the monarchists. However, the result of uh, the referendum that took place on the 8th of December 1974 was negatively, uh, was negative for the monarchy and uh, the Republic uh, overwhelmed monarchy uh, by around 70%. And the uh, monarchy was finally abolished in Greece uh, for the last half century since then. While anarchy was a strong ideological weapon in the hands of monarchists, on the other hand, failures in the conduct of war and in foreign affairs more generally was a liability for the crowns of Greece as well as for uh, the crowns of uh, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe more generally. Uh, I'm moving on to something um, uh, that is relevant, but also it takes you further to 
to other matters, to external matters. Uh, but uh, an, it's an aspect, military and foreign policies, that is uh, very uh, closely bound to the institution of monarchy, especially before the First World War. And this is because prior to 1914, prior to the First World War, as I said, royalty east of the Elbe River had retained fundamental prerogatives in the conduct of military and foreign policies, as I have already said. In fact, as the historians um, concur, the First World War saw some of the latest instances of dynastic high policies. In 1914 to 1919, dynastic and national interests actually clashed in several cases, particularly in the Balkans. There, uh, thereupon, I believe that Greece, especially Greece and Romania, are the most typical examples in this matter. Uh, in particular, King Carol I of Romania was recalcitrant and vehemently opposed to a war with Gem Germany when the, uh, war, the Great War erupted in Europe in August 1914. The Crown Council of Romania, which uh, was convened on the 3rd of August 1914, right at the outbreak of the First World War, initially rejected the pro entente policies of uh, the liberal premier Ion Bratiano. In this way, the Romanian crown turned its back on the Romanian national agenda, the agenda for national aggrandizement and unification, which at, in any case at, uh, uh, would uh, have been at the expense of Austria-Hungary. Um, Romania at the time, I'm explaining myself, was uh, uh, looking forward to the annexation of uh, uh, austro hungarian provinces, namely of the Banat, Bukovina, and firstly and mostly, first and foremost, of Transylvania, the so-called Jerusalem of the Romanians. Therefore, in uh, 1914, uh, at the outset of the First World War, Romania's foreign policies changed after uh, were, uh, were clashing with national interests. However, uh, a few months later, uh, in uh, October of that same year, in October 1914, foreign policies again uh, changed after the sudden death of King Carol I and the accession to the throne of his nephew, King Ferdinand, who was more complacent and greatly influenced by his wife, Queen Marie. Queen Marie, uh, let's remind ourselves of that, was a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. She was born into the British royal family. She uh, bore the title of the Princess of Edinburgh, and she identified herself uh, or be an Urbi as English. This English queen, Queen Marie, led uh, her country, Romania, to the Great War. Two years later, about two years later, in August 1916, and uh, uh, played a major role in the, in the fulfillment of the Romanian national aspirations at the end of the Great War. In Greece now, once again, the ties of King Constantine with the Hohenzollern dynasty had a lot to answer for his initial neutralist policies, for Greece's initial neutralist policies. Uh, King Constantine's conduct of Greece's military policies was a personal matter that involved himself and uh, his brother-in-law, Kaiser Wilhelm II. Um, King Constantine was uh, married to uh, Queen Sophia, the sister of the German Kaiser. Any uh, class, any uh, confrontation between Greece and Germany will, be, will uh, immediately uh, bring uh, the interests or will, will bring, uh, will sever the ties between the Greek and the German royal families 
and will uh, uh, bring uh, King Constantine apart from a very strong and influential imperial family, the dynasty of the Hohenzollerns. Surprisingly enough, though, Bulgaria was also tangled in this monarchical nexus between Athens and Berlin, namely the Bulgarian attack on Salonika in uh, November 1915 was, was initially vetoed by Berlin, meaning the German Kaiser. The advance of the Bulgarian Second Army across the Greek border were, was forestalled under orders from Berlin. Because of that momentum and a prime opportunity to expel the expeditionary army of the Adant from the Balkans, namely Macedonia, were lost. And the Bulgarians, um, let's make it simpler, lost a great opportunity to win the war in the Balkans and to throw the French and the English into the sea before France and uh, England and Russia sent reinforce, uh, reinforcements to the, uh, Bal to the Balkan front. Bulgaria's his commander in chief at the time, Nikola Zekov, notes in his memoirs titled Bul Bulgars Kotovoinsvo, he notes in his memoirs that family politics, that's how he puts it, family politics fav favorable to the king of Greece lay behind the German veto. Uh, Zekov's memoirs are uh, extensively quoted in Richard Holz's uh, study uh, that is titled Balkan Breakthrough, Breakthrough sorry, The Battle of Dobropolia, 1919-1918, uh, a study on the First World War in the Balkans, on the uh, Balkan front that was published in America uh, 22 years ago in 2010. And quite understandably, a Bulgarian invasion of Greece would have been politically disastrous for King Constantine, uh, the King of Greeks. Uh, when the Bulgarian incursion into Greece eventually and inevitably happened, all the same, six months later, in the summer of uh, 1916, a Republican revolution led by Eleftherios Venizelos erupted in Salonika. The Venizelist Revolution led to King Constantine's dethronement about a year later in June 1917 and brought Greece into the war uh, on the side of the Adant. Anyhow, all in all, the negative outcome of the Great War for the Central Powers was regarded to a certain degree as a failure of monarchy for the reasons already mentioned. Um, for all these reasons, defeat and armistice um, signaled the inglorious end of monarchy in Austria, Hungary, Germany, Russia, and Turkey, as we all know. And dynastic change took place in Bulgaria and Greece, in Greece, wherein King Constantine was ousted eventually in 1922, and uh, a republic was uh, proclaimed two years later in 1924. The First World War certainly was a watershed in the history of monarchy in Europe, and particularly in Eastern and Central Europe. For that matter, historians uh, uh, identify the First World War as a revolutionary war, that uh, a revolutionary war that dramatically altered and changed profoundly the balance of political and social power in a series of countries, especially in Eastern and Central Europe, the balance of political and social power in, fa in favor of liberalism, republicanism, ethnic nationalism also, as well as Bolshevism and feminism. That's all for now. Thank you very much for your most kind attention. Thank you very much for this very comprehensive lecture. So, dear colleagues, we have now the opportunity to ask questions or comments. You can see here, sorry to interrupt you, the images of uh, Capodistrias on the left, King Otto on the right, 
the, some images of uh, King George I, a minor at the time of his advent in Greece. He was just 17 years old. And a few years later, as a young king of the Greeks, uh, King Carol of Romania, King Ferdinand, or Knyaz, a prince at the time, and later king of Bul uh, the Bulgarians, uh, Leftherius Venizelos, the liberal premier and um, um, revolutionary, and King Constantine on the right. Uh, the last king of Greece, uh, Constantine II, uh, who was ousted in 1974 following a referendum. And last, lastly, and mostly, you can also um, uh, think more about uh, this not well-known king, King Ferdinand of Romania, as well as Queen Marie of uh, Romania uh, that lay behind the scenes, but played a major role in the shift of Romania's policies in the First World War and its final victory in uh, 1919. Okay, thank you very much again. I'm lowering this. This document, and I'm open to questions. Any questions? I suppose I was clear enough and um, I left no question marks in anybody's mind. Uh, can I have a question, please? Yes, of course. Well, uh, Alexandra is in the chair now. I think yes, can course, I have the please. question now? Yes, so, sure. Because you were drawing parallels between uh, the situation in Greece and uh, in Bulgaria, and uh, it is well known uh, amongst the researchers of uh, our modern history that uh, our Tsars were often drawing upon uh, medieval examples and uh, intentionally aligning themselves with uh, certain famous Bulgarian medieval rulers. Could you also draw such parallels uh, for the practice of Greek kings in the modern era? And if this is the case, if they were actually employing Byzantine emperors, uh, could you give us some examples uh, which Byzantine emperors were favor favored by the Greek kings? Thank you. That's a very good question. Yes, actually, King Constantine, who was the most, uh, we'll say, ambitious and arrogant monarch of Greece, uh, initially very much victorious in the two Balkan wars, in the two wars in the Balkans in 1912 to 1913. Yet later on, he became a liability for Greece during the First World War and led to a, the Asia Minor disaster, as we call it, historically. He, uh, King Constantine the First was unofficially or semi-officially uh, named King Constantine the 11th. The 12th, sorry, the 12th, King Constantine the 12th, meaning the successor of the last emperor of Byzantium, uh, meaning uh, 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 Emperor Constantine the 11th, Dragatsis. He was the son uh, of um, actually of uh, uh, Serbian princes. Anyway, King, uh, he was uh, seen as the successor to the last emperor of Byzantium. Emperor Constantine the Eleventh, who fell uh, on the walls of Constantinople, fighting the Turks in 1453. He, uh, uh, when he was born, as or shortly after he was born, um, when he was still an adolescent, he was also bestowed the title of the Duke of Sparta. So there was a double connection with both both uh, Byzantium and Greek uh, ancient past the glorious past of ancient Greece. And uh, were any particular symbols uh, applied uh, 
like borrowed from uh, medieval or ancient times, like uh, uh, coats of arms, like any particular uh, imagery that would be associated with uh, ancient times, was it employed by the modern Greek kings? Because, for example, our Tsars were very much in love with certain medieval symbols, and they would often reproduce them in order to, you know, relate themselves to the medieval dynasty. No, actually, in Greece, there was no such connection. Uh, this um, um, succession uh, from Byzantium was um, seen by the Greek elite as more or less, and the political order as the political elite as more or less ridiculous. So, Eleftherios Venizelos, uh, who was obviously a great statesman, uh, he didn't accept that. He didn't allow this to happen, to take a more official form and to be symbolized in coats of arms and in other formal insignia. So these titles of King Constantine remained unofficial or semi-official at the very most. Did they produce crowns, uh, scepters, and other items that would be associated with uh, monarchic power? No, because uh, after the dethronement, the only scepter and crown was uh, held, were held by King Otto, the first king of Greece. Later on, after uh, the ousting of this Bavarian dynasty in 1863, the kings of Greece uh, were, uh, let's say, democratically elected, and they were sworn in when they resumed power. They, they, they were not crowned. They had no crowns or scepters or anything like that. The, the usual. Thank incident. you. Nothing. It's a pleasure. Do you have other questions or comments? Hopefully everything was open and clear, I suppose. It definitely was. Actually, uh, Professor Konstantinova just wrote me that she has some problems with the sound and sent the question to you, uh, which is uh, not directly rela related to the topic of today's lectures. Uh, but uh, he, uh, she hopes uh, that uh, you probably may tell us why, in your opinion, in long conflicts between the Balkan monarchs and political leaders, the former usually win the political battles. Um, politicians have, I think, I believe, uh, more uh, legitimization. Uh, than uh, monarchs. Monarchs are, um, are high-handed and they are apart from the society, from the grassroots, whereas uh, politicians, democratic politicians, uh, are, um, um, are forced to have uh, a close connection with the society and the crowd. So, um, when uh, there is a class between uh, a strong statesman and a monarch, uh, the outcome is in favor of the, uh, the common man, the statesman, the, 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 the strong man. So at least in Greece's history, this is um, something that uh, runs through modern history. Every time that a, a Greek king, no matter how uh, popular he was, eventually lost the battle against the strong politician. Thank you so much. So other questions? Professor Preshlenov. Uh, thank you very much. 
Professor Pumidis, thank you so much for your so interesting uh, lecture. And uh, I hope uh, next time you will be uh, a guest uh, at our institute uh, in present, not only uh, on Zoom. Uh, I'm eager to welcome you uh, and show you what happens uh, with our younger colleagues who are very excited to um, develop further the collaboration between our institute and your university. So uh, I extend uh, the, an invitation to visit us again uh, in present. Thank you so much. Thank you too, with great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so last chance to ask a question. Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah. We should have an open door policy. These things seem very distant, but uh, okay. Um, they touch on high politics, which are always fascinating. High politics are always thrilling, I suppose. Колеги, други въпроси, коментари, впечатления, които бихте искали да споделите? It looks like everything was clear. <laughs> okay, excellent. I suppose we are coming to the end of this lecture. This Yes, I would like to remind to everyone that uh, the recording of today's lectures will be shortly uploaded um, uh, to, to YouTube, to our Institute channel there. And I will send you shortly the link to the recording and you can use it, uh, whatever you may uh, like. So, I would like on behalf of um, everybody on the director of the Institute and uh, Associate Professor Yura Konstantinova, who is trying actually to join the meeting again. She told me that um, she experienced some uh, problems with the internet connection. Yura? I'm here. <laughs> Great. So I have a problems with the uh, internet and I don't hear anything from the answer of uh, Spiro. Excuse me, but I hope the, the other time. <laughs> you will hear the recording afterwards. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much for this very interesting lecture. I hope you will um, join our future activities and events. Mm -hmm. We will keep you infor informed about uh, the upcoming um, international events that we plan to organize. And we hope that um, you will be able to attend in person here in Bulgaria. Certainly, certainly. И аз ви благодарим много и до виждане, до скоро виждане на всички колеги. Скоро. До скоро, да, да.